So this is building communities here. So with the with the goal being primarily, at least for this discussion for fire camp, being hacker maker space type places. So I'm Bob Waldron. I live in Appleton, Wisconsin, northeast Wisconsin, north, 18 counties up there. And I'm interested in technology. My official self-given title is uh, Community Technology Evangelist. So my background is chemical engineering. I worked for Kimberly Clark as an engineer. And they booted me out the door about, you know, along with a whole bunch of other people back in 2003. And uh, so I did some consulting work, but also started doing a lot of, a lot of uh, just playing with technology stuff. Because I've always liked technology. I had an original Mac 128. Uh, as a process tool, it was kind of cool. I went in a went in a Team Electronics store in Wausau, and hometown of Marissa Mayer. If anybody you know Google, but uh, anyway, I walked in and, and said I wanted to get a computer, a personal computer for work. And he said, Well, there's a a PC, actually there's a PC Junior there from IBM, or there's a Mac. He said, I, I'm busy with a customer. I don't have time to show you the the PC, but you can just go and use the Mac. And so it, it, you know, it just had draw on it or Mac Paint, and so I, I sat there and I started drawing a flow sheet of the pulp mill where I work. And you know, he didn't tell me anything, and I hadn't used one, so I walked out of the store with Mac. So that's kind of cool. But anyway, so I've liked technology for many years. So I'm also interested in communities. Uh, there's a number of different things I get involved with. Like I don't know if you, any of you are into local foods or uh, slow movement sustainability, like the natural step. Um, but that's all about building communities. There's some other activities I'm involved with that, that is also building communities. So I'm real interested in figuring out how to build long-term communities. I don't want to get a hacker space launch, like in Detroit right now, Ford gave, I think, gave uh, the hacker space people, or actually, I think, they're, I think they're doing a tech shop. But they gave them a bunch of money, you know. So they're going to build one. But if they don't have a long-term community, right now Ford's really hurt, or I mean uh, Detroit's really hurting. There's a ton of auto worker type engineers and people out of work. So they'll probably have a lot of people use it right now. But if times get better, people might fade away because they're so busy with their families and work and everything else. So I want to focus on building communities. So and. I'm an engineer, so I'm not real good with building communities, so I need help. Um, so for the hacker makerspace type stuff, what it is is people who are passionate about making things. So that's, for this particular discussion, that's the kind of community I'm interested in. And a couple of the places where you can make things are the MIT Fab Lab. Uh, yeah, I don't know how many of you know about what the MIT Fab Lab is, but it, it was started out as more of a social experiment. If people can make anything they can think of, what will they come up with and what will they make? So that was the original intent of the Fab Lab, the MIT Fab Lab. And then there's the tech shops, which are more on a macro scale, making bigger things than the original Fab Lab was designed to make. There's hacker spaces, which probably lean more towards the Fab Lab smaller scale stuff, although some hacker spaces do huge things. And then there's maker spaces, which probably have a little bit less focus on electronics and computers, and generally are bigger things, not necessarily, but, but they make, make a lot of things there where there's no electronics involved. In and, and the hacker space you can too. But. And then there's fusion or hybrids of, of these concepts and other things thrown in. So some examples in, in, the, in this area, the Bucket Works in Milwaukee. Uh, what's the tagline on that, Pete? Fitness? Uh, health, a health, health Club, club for, the, for Your Mind. Yeah, Health Club for Your Mind or Health Club for Your Brain. Um, the MIT Fab Lab, there's one of those at Fox Valley Technical College in Appleton. Uh, there's Makerspace in Milwaukee, Sector 67 starting in Madison. Uh, I was hoping somebody would show up from Iger Lab. I talked to a guy uh, down in Rockford, Illinois. There's a cool place called the Iger Lab. 
So if you just go to igerlab.org, you can see what they're doing. But that got started, like a lot of places get started, because of the pain Rockford had when their economy imploded. They had an employer that was huge in the area, I forget who it was, but it just fell apart and their unemployment went way up and the community leaders got together and said, what are we gonna do? So there's colleges, Chamber of Commerce, all kinds of people collaborated on launching this Tiger Lab. Uh, so there's a tech shop out in California, and now there's one in Triangle Park, one uh, gonna be opening in San Francisco. Um, there's pumping station one down in Chicago, Noise Bridge in San Francisco, at Pittsburgh. Then there's the events like Maker Fair. Um, I don't know how many different Maker Fairs they have now, but it, it started out, you know, the, the San Francisco Bay Area one, and then they had, do they have Pittsburgh or Pennsylvania? I saw one out in Austin. Austin. Well, but, but they, they're they starting to do, it's kind of like tech. New York and the UK and Tokyo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it used to be, you know, I don't know how many years they had in San Francisco, two, three, four years. 2006. Six, okay. Yeah, so that started a little after the bar camp started. But, so there's the tech events in addition to the, the locations, and then there's the bar camps, which are all over the world now, just because of a couple people. Um, there's hack fests, other ad hoc tech events. So these are all things where if you've got a community, you can do some really cool, fun stuff. So critical mass is what you really need to have things happen. And there's two types of critical mass. There's actual critical mass where you have enough of something to cause a reaction. And if you don't have actual mass, or actual critical mass, but you still wanna have that cool thing happen, you need to create a virtual critical mass. So in terms of critical masses of people, if you have very high population density, like in Tokyo, New York City, uh, Los Angeles, other places, that leads to a high relevant population density. So whatever your topic is, there will be a bunch of people interested in that particular topic. The high relevant population density leads to actual critical mass. So in San Francisco, I rode the bus out to San Francisco to visit my daughter up in Arcata. I stopped at the Starbucks just right across from the bus station downtown, and I'm sitting there, and it wasn't the same as in Appleton, Wisconsin Starbucks, because there was two guys talking about their startup to an investor, pitching their business. There were a couple other guys coding at tables, to, I was talking to about their projects. Another guy I was talking to about uh, work he does in uh, Southeast Asia with uh, battery companies over there. And you know, I didn't have to do a whole lot to, to talk to those people and to see things going on. And that's because of the actual critical mass of it. That stuff just happens naturally because there's such a big concentrated ecosystem for technology. So in actual critical mass areas, the communities coalesce. They come together somewhat on their own, and it's easy to find like minds. Some areas in terms of tech critical mass, Silicon Valley, Seattle, Boston, Austin, New York City, and lots of other places globally. Madison? <laughs> uh, no. Not yet. No. Mm -hmm. So in this area, in the Midwest, Chicago is, is the closest to actual critical mass. But Chicago isn't really a hub of high tech. They've got certain niches like uh, financial software, they're big in that, and there's other areas. But even though they have uh, kind of a critical ma actual critical mass, um, somebody was telling me that Ash Dryden was down in uh, Bar Camp Chicago last week and I don't know, Pete, did you talk to her at all about? Yeah. Because somebody said there were only like 25 people or something. Yeah, it wasn't like this is way bigger. Yeah, so, so you know, even though Chicago's, I forget how many million people, um, they still had a bar camp and it didn't just happen. Uh, Minneapolis, their, their bar camps, they're real structured, like you have to submit what presentation you want. What's, I mean, they do more presentations not sessions, and 
you can't just sign up that morning because they publish a schedule and everything. So Milwaukee, um, I don't know why it happens, but Milwaukee's been pretty close to what I think of as a bar camp where there's actual camping, where it's overnight. It's not just one day. Yeah, it's very informal, but they try to use the open space concept to, to, to facilitate it. Um, but again, it still takes a lot of work. Um, Pete's been working on it for what, five years, four or five years? Two thousand six, yeah. Yeah, and if you don't have people working on it, if it's not an intentional community, it's just not gonna happen. Um, Madison, uh, it seems like, what is there, is this the fourth one? Third. Third one? Yeah. And, uh, you know, you would think with the school here, you'd have more more people interested in something like the bar camp, but, you know, there just isn't. Appleton, at one point back in 2004, I was going to do a bar camp there because I read about the original bar camp out in San Francisco and then read about the Seattle Mine Camp, which was really cool too. And so I was going to do an Appleton, but I just figured out pretty quickly that there wasn't anywhere near a critical mass there and there just wouldn't be the people. Um, and then you have Ashland, Wisconsin, which is, I don't know how many people there are, but it's up in, way up in northern Wisconsin. And they do some stuff uh, with entrepreneurism and there's a couple little companies that do technology, but there's no way they have actual critical mass. So virtual critical mass is what I've been pushing. How do you create uh, a critical mass to make something happen by, by all the virtual tools you have? So how many have read Here Comes Everybody by Clay Shirky? Nobody? Okay. Okay, so in there it talks about how the internet enables people to come together and kind of get the network effect of, of causing things to happen just because it's so easy to connect and communicate. Um, the starfish and the spider talks about kind of distributed networking, distributed organizations where there's not somebody on the top telling the people below what to do and they tell the other people and the other people. Everybody's kind of just working together and it's kind of like bar camp. There have to be people interested in making it continue. So it's kind of distributed organizations. Uh, Never Eat Alone, has anybody read that? That's Keith Ferrazzi. So what he is, is he's a networking guru. So he talks all about how the, the personal networking, not computer networking. So he talks all about how uh, you can connect with people and the power of doing that. And uh, it's one of the reasons that even though I'm an introverted engineer, I really gotten into doing a lot of this kind of stuff because it's like anything else. Once you start doing it, you learn things and you get better and you get better and you get better. So um, those are three good books if you're trying to create virtual critical mass. And then uh, three things that are important for, for creating the criti virtual critical mass are your communications have to be good because you're not just going to naturally run into each other. You have to have some face-to-face -face meetings. In spite of the world is flat and everything else, if you don't have some component of face-to-face, -face, your virtual communities aren't going to aren't going to work. Um, and then telecollaboration, being able to work from a distance, uh, being able to have you know offshore outsourcing, all that kind of stuff. You can have uh, uh, follow the sun work teams where. <laughs> Somebody's rolling their eyes back there, but uh, you, theoretically, I mean, there's this guy I work with in Milwaukee that he's he's done that for big companies, and so one team hands off a project to somebody else as the earth is spinning, and there's always people working at it. So, why am I concerned about critical mass, or why is anybody building a community? You have to have some type of critical mass to have a long-term sustainable community. So you know you can you can have 20 guys who know each other. They all went to college at the same time. They all like sort of the same kind of stuff, and they can start a hackerspace. But when a couple of the leaders of that group 
go off to a new job somewhere or start having kids and don't have any time to do it anymore, a lot of times the thing will just fall apart. And so something like that, you just, you don't have new members coming in, you don't have new people taking responsibility for making things happen. So you have to have critical mass to have that long-term sustainability. And what, what those kind of mean is that if you get leader burnout, it doesn't kill it. If you get leadership change, it doesn't kill it. High resource requirements, you know, like if you've got six guys, uh, that's not sustainable community in a lot of ways because unless they're pretty wealthy, um, they're not gonna be able to provide all the resources they need. And then a sustainable community means that short-term problems, when you're going through rough times, you know, there's problems, you work through them, and you, you keep going. It doesn't, it doesn't kill you just because you ran into a few problems. So for those long-term long -term sustainable communities, you have to define what the common goals are. You know, when people aren't quite sure what it is, a lot of people might go, hey, that sounds good, but all 10 people sitting around the table will have a different idea of what they think is good. So you have to kind of discuss and get those out in the open as far as what everybody thinks the goals are. And that's gonna be both the initial group of people that start the effort, start the community, and as the membership changes, uh, you know, those, those are gonna change. And this isn't supposed to be a presentation, so somebody should speak up and say something there. Um, the, the sustainable community needs to be able to satisfy a wide spectrum of members. So you got the new people coming in that don't know what Arduino is. You got the people that have built a few things with Arduino and they've been doing it for a year at least. And you know they're, they're not pros, but they could help the new people. And then you got the, the veterans who've done everything you can imagine, or at least everything so far. And if you don't have some way for them to share their knowledge and some opportunity for them to learn a few new things, you know, they're gonna get tired. They aren't gonna go off every, if every session they go to is all a fact session for the new people, they aren't gonna hang around or they'll sit in the corner and just talk to themselves and they won't really be participating. So, you know, the community has to have something for, for all three types of those members. So for just some random points here. What I've learned on doing a number of events and starting a number of groups is, if you try to do it by yourself, you're gonna fail. If you don't have some kind of a, a, a small to medium group of core passionate members who, you know, everybody's gonna help out and support each other and take over if one guy's got problems, you have to have that core to get it started. You need to have regularly scheduled meetings because if it's just kind of you meet and then when somebody decides you want to have another meeting, you call that, you need regular ones. Um, then there's the 1990 rule where if you got 100 people who kind of think Arduino is cool, one of the people is going to make things happen with, with Arduino. Nine of them are going to actively help out and participate in a lot of the activities. And then 90 of the people will either do nothing or just show up randomly every now and then. So if you if you identify 100 people who say, yeah, our Arduino school, I want to do that, you can't be disappointed if, if there's only five or 10 or 15 that show up. Because most people have a lot of other stuff they're doing too. Yeah, you lose that was a blue screen. Yeah. <laughs> oh, shit. But it's yeah. not that, so. Oh, wait. <laughs> I'm using Windows. <laughs> 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 what is this Windows you see? I heard it somewhere. I don't know my friend uses it. Yeah, I think I want to squeeze it, maybe. No, I think I want to squeeze it. So, how many of you started a community? Pete? Yeah. Mitch? Matt? Yeah, I can't call it Sarah yet. <laughs> How about Flourish? Is that the I didn't start it. I, I just kind of picked up on it after somebody else did. And I've never actually ran the town myself. I got a question for you. Do you think that the Milwaukee area has a critical mass for, for starting, say, a group? I, I, I know what kind of group? Uh, well, I know there's 
say like a maker, a hacker space. I know there's a maker space that started up, but I don't know how they um, so I can't comment on that. Like what? Well, it's a long time. Years. Yeah. Well, yeah, but uh, there's another maker space too, though, that just got started. Yeah. So else. Bucket Works in Milwaukee is basically James in terms of driving the thing. No, um, it, I, I think it was. I don't think it is as much anymore. He's kind of distributed that. But he is. Definitely. Yeah. He's letting go. Yeah, he's, he's definitely let the chart for the like first like five years. Yeah. But he got to a point where we said, Jim, you can't, you can't do all this. There's a lot of people who believe in the idea. Uh -huh. Let them help you. So he's kind of done that to some degree. Let other people do it. It's important because cool. yeah. people aren't empowered to do, uh, um, you know, lead lead things. They're never going to rise to the occasion. Yeah, with um, with Web Four and Four, which I and I I, I hate saying. I started it because I say I helped start it. I helped start it because, again, I, I'm not I'm not trying to get any credit. I like to say I played a part in it because part of what I think is important with this is, you know, if you start something, it's it's not about you and it shouldn't be about you. It should be about the community, people involved. And I always saw my role as a community person as um, kind of shining the spotlight back at everyone else. So when new people come, it's like, hey, what do you do? What are you interested in? What do you do? You want to do a demo? What are you going to talk about? and get them excited and interested as well because that's going to get them coming back and hopefully telling someone else. And, um, you know, I've seen some groups where it is kind of, it's all about, it's all about me and the guy who runs the thing. It's, here's my talk, here's my presentation, I'm talking at you, I'm, I'm broadcasting. It's not, it's not a two-way street as much, and I think that turns people off because they, they're not getting involved. Yeah, and that, that can't work in the spaces we're talking about here. Like NoiseBridge, I was a co-founder, and, but, we explicitly set it up with no leaders. I'm now just a member. I, I travel half the time, yet NoiseBridge continues to thrive. Yeah. Um, but that's because the culture when it was started was one of, if you want something done, you do it. We call that duocracy. Um, and I didn't want to be a leader. I don't want to be a part of an organization where there are leaders and followers. Um, that's no fun. That's too much work. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, I, I like to use the term facilitator instead. You know, like, I'll facilitate as much as I can, but, I, like, I can't do it all. Um, with Web 4 and 4, you know, I, just, I kind of planned all the first meetings, but I, I'm like, hey, what can you do? Can you talk? And it's kind of the point where, you know, if I don't, if I don't go, it'll still happen, and I'll miss it, and I feel bad, but that's great that it can happen completely without me, so. So does everybody here know what Web 4 and 4 is? Oh, okay. Watch it, the, the quick story is um, in 2006, I went to a, remember, everyone knows meetup.com, um, a web design meetup in Milwaukee. And this was a collapse of, when we had started, everything was free. So there were like six different meetups in Milwaukee, like PHP, web design, web development. And then started charging, and they also left the one group called the web design meetup. And I went to this thing, and there were about eight people in a circle, and they're like, well, what should we talk about? Uh, I don't know, I'm working on the site, oh, let's look at that. So I went to the first one and I said, hey, uh, can we like do actual real presentations? Like, can I talk about something like that? I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, go ahead. So I came back and did a presentation. I ended it with, you know, who's, who's up next month who wants to talk? And I got someone on the hook and they did it. And they did the same thing, they're like, who wants to talk next month? So we just kind of had, you know, the core group of like, you know, eight people, but we kept going. We managed to pull in new people now and then. Um, and eventually changed it, turned it into Web 4 and 4, um, which is a group that meets once a month every second Thursday, so again, it fucking works. And we just talk about web-related things. We usually have uh, guests, which sometimes we pull people from outside our community and kind of get them involved too, or we just have someone from within the group talk or demo, whatever, and um, it's been going pretty good, I guess. So that's, that's a... That's that's a situation where a community was formed and has been maintained in spite of not having an actual critical mass. It, I mean, it's only happening because Pete and a couple other people are making it one, happen. One important thing we did is um, we well back then we recorded audio, and we so after the after the meeting, there was we downloaded full audio recording it. We couldn't see pictures on Flickr. We everyone would talk about. We published about it and let people know. Yep, and that's you the marketing story. You gotta yep. let people know what's going on, and get them interested. So, 
So Web 608 is kind of a spin-off of the guys from Madison always used to come to Milwaukee for Web 4 and 4. And they're like, we should just do this in Madison. So Web 608 happened, and for a while there was Web 715 or something, yeah. up in Claire or something. Yeah. So, yeah, and I got, and I think uh, Jacob Rufo down in Rockford tried doing one there. I don't know how it took off, but you know, we just, and the concept is it's, it's car camp, like it's show up and it's, we do what we do it all, we make it happen. And, yeah. So those we could do web nine two zero. Yeah. So those are things. Kind of the same. Those are things yeah. that are happening because people are managing them. They're intentional. Those aren't actual critical mass. And in Milwaukee, I think uh, history kind of says there's not an actual critical mass for a hacker space. Right. It's going to have to be intentional. And therefore, you got to think about things that you know will create a virtual critical mass. Like Pete was talking, you got to communicate and market what you're doing. Um, you have to make sure people know that that opportunity is out there. I had a meeting just this week with a guy who's working with me on this hacker maker space for Appleton, and he wasn't aware that the Tech Valley, uh, Fox Valley Tech had a fab lab. He, I mean, he kind of heard about it, but he didn't know that they had monthly uh, intro sessions. And I said, well, you know, why didn't you check into it? And it's on the web that, you know, that says they have them. And he said, well, I didn't know they had them. Nobody told me or whatever. And I said, well, you know, you're going to have to look for it. So to me, an actual critical mass is there's so many things going on and so many people that either somebody tells you about it in a fairly short order after it's available, or you read about it in some kind of media that you pay attention to. Um, if you have to search things out, like him and the intros for the Fab Lab, if you got to search those out, that kind of says it's not an actual critical mass because nobody told him and it wasn't in the news that he was reading. I and mean, I think you have to, as in the group, you have to do a little bit of marketing. Oh yeah, absolutely. When it's when it's not a actual critical mass, when there's not a high population. Yeah, or even more. if there is. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Because like in San Francisco, there's so many things going on that yeah. you can't keep track of yeah, all that's of them. True. You put the word out so that word of mouth connects everybody, and that's true whether it's a big city or a small town. So uh, people have to know about what you're doing so you can find out about what other people are doing. And open up your space, whatever it is you're forming, so that people can come there and you can collaborate. Like, we have space, what do you want to do here? So uh, just like uh, the bar camp, nothing would happen here if people didn't, if people showed up expecting to be entertained. Yeah. Um, so we have, it's up to us to make our camp happen. It's up to people who start maker, hacker, whatever spaces to make it happen. Well, people show up with enthusiasm, but we have to connect with the greater community. There's, um, in, in Milwaukee, we were doing um, uh, Milwaukee Dev House, which is kind of a super happy, kind of party atmosphere with laptops development. And they kind of happen every now and then, but there actually is another group kind of doing Milwaukee Hacker House, which is, there's one coming up September 11th in Milwaukee. Basically, one guy opens up his house, invites everybody over to do any dev work they need. They can work together to show off the projects. Um, so that's, I guess that's kind of a uh, you know, portable hacker space. Sorry, temporary. Well, temporary. Space. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, they're doing those. I've kind of done like three or four of them. And it's basically, though, it's, it's not real schedule. It's more like, hey, we should just do this. And they do one, and six months later, they do another one. So I mean, that might be a way to start as well. I have some comments about starting Flourish. I was there when they tried to start everything. and um, So he's talking about Flourish. Does everybody know what that is? Uh, it's a, we run an open source conference at the kind of posted out of the University of Illinois at Chicago uh, to promote in the use and adoption of open source software. Um, and we run in April for Mark Blaine advertising. Um, okay, so, but it didn't come, it didn't really start that way. I mean, it started as like uh, the UIC log, we wanted to run a, a, a conference and we wanted it to be bigger than just, we have these fairly large install fests. We really want something that bring everyone together in the whole Illinois, in the whole Chicago area. And we're gonna call it, one of the names, the working title for this conference was Uberfest. And we we're gonna try to get it to come out at the same time as, um, as Windows Vista to like try to just try to get people to go to Linux instead because we heard that we kind of got, had the impression that Windows Vista is going to be a terrible operating system, which we were kind of right. Um, okay, so the, but the, the the thing is that he did wrong. Roberto, he ran the log at the time, and 
he, he really did wrong is like he said no one person is in charge of this uh, event. It has to be, it's going to be a community run event. Everyone's on an e equal level. And uh, I, I, I see you can't, there seemed to be a theme here of not having a, a central run community. But I mean, this thing was just starting out. I mean, somebody, I think that's the reason it failed is because no one person was in charge. No, I, I think I. I do like the community idea. I, I, I think every, I like everyone pull, pulling their part, but I think an orga, a hierarchical organization structure really does um, cause things to happen. And um, I, I, think, I think Roberto had to be the one that, that, he was kind of the one pulling people together. He should have been the one that people went to to organize things to make sure everyone knew what they were doing. Um, and I think anyone that's run an event, there's always somebody at the top that kind of makes it happen. Even if it's a community event, there's someone you go to, someone that knows what's going on, someone who delegates. Um, Uberfest fell apart. And so he eventually um, met, met, he went to the universe, uh, Reflections and Projections at UIUC, and there he met, um, uh, I forget, he had a speaker there from Google that, that was our main, our keynote from the, uh, ended up being our keynote at the first flourish, and Roberto ran that conference. And um, it wasn't until he be decided to, to pick up and run something that he act actually was able to create a conference. And from there, he's able to pass it off onto someone else, but there's still a hierarchical structure. So um, community is great, but you still need that hierarchical structure. You still need to delegate. Uh, I'll actually differ with that. Um, you don't need a hierarchical structure. But you do need people that step up to take yeah. leadership and responsibility. So the Hope Conference was uh, is, is, um, visioned by Emmanuel Goldstein. Um, so, um, but he wasn't the leader of the conference. There were a bunch of people that he collected around, including myself, um, who stepped up to take leadership roles. And collectively, we got other people to take uh, subsets of that. So these hierarchies formed, but they weren't. It wasn't a hierarchical structure. Uh, if you can see the subtle difference there. So it's temporary taking responsibility when responsibility needs to be taken, giving it up when other people are empowered to take it, and that worked really well for uh, the next hope, which happened last month. Do um, you think that would scale well? Well, hope was about three thousand people. Okay. So um, the thing is, if uh, the conference is just starting out and someone says, yeah, this is a cool idea, let's, let's have a conference, and then they go, let's all have a conference, and no one steps That's up, exactly. <laughs> then, then that doesn't work. But people have to step up and take responsibility when they think they uh, have um, the ability to do so and have the respect of others to do it. There still has to be a key focal person that's in charge. I mean, that, that it's still like... You feed your ideas through. It doesn't have to be a person in charge, but some a key person, one central point you feed the ideas through. Well, no, I, I don't think it's that there's a central person you feed the ideas through. I think it's some somebody or a couple people who will do what Mitch was talking about or what Pete was saying where, you know, he didn't try and run things. He got other people to run them. Mm -hmm. So, like the first, the first bar camp in Milwaukee, if Justin and Pete hadn't been there, it wouldn't have happened. But those guys didn't do everything. What they did, the thing, that, the critical thing that those two guys did was they got other people involved, and they made sure that other people were doing stuff. Yeah. They, they, and you know, I mean, like Sharing enthusiasm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and like, I had a question on, on, uh, on uh, the Bar Camp Milwaukee website, and I shot a note to Pete because he's involved in all that stuff. Well. He didn't tell somebody else, hey, you know, take care of this, which would somewhat have been, you know, taking leadership. He said, why don't you, you know, talk to Kevin, because he's, so I just shut Kevin and out, and I've been pointing stuff at him, but, you know, if, if he had tried to say, okay, well, I'll, I'll make sure this gets done, and I'll, I'll be the one in control. So I don't think you need somebody to run stuff through, but you do need at least one person, and hopefully a couple people, who will see things that need to be done and then get people involved in it. Because if, if you can't get other people involved, I go back to if you don't have a core group that's big enough, 
you're going to burn it all. I, I've seen that. Yeah, you're right. You do need to absolutely <coughs> need to delegate. Um, if if you're a and you can't delegate such that it feels like somebody told me I have to do it. You have to make sure that people feel like it's theirs and they're in charge. You yeah. Know, you don't want to have them keep coming delegate. back to you and say, you know, is this what you want? You just get them to do something and you let them figure out what it's going to be. You got to be willing to have it not be exactly the way you would do it. Because if you're not willing to do that, then you might as well go somewhere else. Yep, I totally agree with that. Yeah, and depending on the group, I mean, every group's going to have a different dynamic. So, um, um, in the, like Noise Bridge, I'm total hippie anarchist weirdo punk type. So uh, it's a culture of that. Uh, but other groups form, and they're more comfortable with hierarchy. Then they should form a hierarchical group. Um, ones that are in the consensus or more into um, majority rule, whatever, whatever the group's into, they should create that culture and uh, attract more people. That will necessarily and naturally like attract, mm -hmm. yeah, more people that fit in with that culture, and um, which attracts more people that, that fit in. It'll also um, just naturally repel people that don't fit in. People will come around and say, like, this doesn't feel right to me. There might be some friction along the way, but they'll eventually leave. So uh, it works really well that way. So Matt, what have, what's been your experience? How long were you with Pittsburgh so far? The um, heck, about a year. So. And what have you seen in terms of the community, how it was formed, and how it's being grown or maintained? Well, um, we kind of have, uh, reason the core group of people, we haven't really changed too much since we started, I don't think. So you haven't grown new members? We have in. grown some people, we've also lost people, so it hasn't changed, there's been some turnover, basically. Um, part of it is that we're not, like, a lot of the people that are there are getting what they want out of it, so it's not necessarily a problem that we're not growing. Um, I think that maybe long term, maybe it's an issue, but I think that we're mostly just concerned about doing things like, we're not really, I think, too concerned about creating this great structure that's going to last forever. I think we're more just interested in doing, like, having the machine tools we want and being able to be there. And if it works for a while, that's great, but if it doesn't, then, oh, okay. like, there's, like, four other groups in the Pittsburgh area that are also trying to figure out machine shops and things like that. We know about them, and they know about us, and some of them are a good fit, and they hang out with us, and some of them aren't, so it's, we're not really too worried about it. Okay. Yeah, and that goes back to, you know, identifying what the common goals of the group are. If, if you're not trying to build something long term, if it's I mean, yeah. for three, four years, and then people go their separate ways, then that's what I mean, the group wants. If it lasts longer than that, that's great, but we're not trying to force it. Yeah, okay. So you can actually yeah. have literally like uh, marketing out to places. The thing that come out of a hacker space is you get all these really smart people in the same place all talking together. Yeah. And that's what you need, like, you need a couple tables just for people to hang out on. And like, you know, almost sleep there. Just the social space. Just yeah, just the social space, yeah. Oh, that's really critical. 